Hello and welcome to National Poetry Day 2020 with the City Chapter. For those of you who are not familiar with the City Chapter, it is a partnership of the four libraries in Armagh, including the Robinson Library, the Cardinal Lofi Library and Archive, and the two libraries and libraries, which are Armagh City Library and the Irish and Local Studies Library. The aim of the City Chapter is to promote reading and the spoken word. Usually, we would be bringing you an event live for National Poetry Day. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to do this this year, but we are still delighted to be able to bring you an event online. And this has been made possible by our two sponsors, who I would like to thank tonight. And they are the Arts Council for Northern Ireland and the John Hewitt Society. We have two poets for you tonight, Maura Johnson and Kate Newman. Maura is from Moneymore, where she's still living today. She is now retired from education and she has worked widely with groups of children and community groups. Her latest volume of poetry is called The Whetstone. The following poems form a sequence which I call Mortality. My father, as a young man, six feet tall with startled hair, would plough, make hay, herd cattle on fair days. In the evenings he would meet Eamon and Jerry McNanny at the road end, to smoke and laugh his large laugh, walk the three miles home where, hearing him come from his rendezvous, the mare in the barn would softly nicker. My father loved to use words, called himself a knight of the road, rattled daily to Belfast in a small green Bedford lorry, BNT 241, carrying potatoes to McVeigh's in May's market, chugging and shaking past milestones, missing nothing and missing everything, dreaming of making a stir, himself helmeted, streamlined on a motorbike, mind blown. Full Throttle was the name of the dog-eared only book he ever owned. My father wore, depending on the job in hand, yellow boots or wellingtons, which he called waders. He'd sit in his chair, put his legs straight out, and one of us would bend and brace and pull, kneeling for a better grip, face close to trouser turnips, full of hayseeds, cigarette ash, pig meal. And when we bumped back and down boots in our hands, a grunt meant, thank you daughter. My father drank three whiskies on my sister's wedding day. Standing he wept bewildered as she blithely went away. Later, Guinness in hand, still brittle in this unused sorrow, he rallied to his usual high spirits and took it for what it was worth. My father, five slow days before he died, suffered his 76th birthday, lying in his loosened skin on the sofa. My mother patted his hand tentatively and he whispered, give us a wee birdie. The words he used when we were children and we kissed the stubbly cheek or chin. I left them being neither needed nor noticed, left them there together, not touching, but bound together, I feeling how unknown, unknowable it all was. He'd have relished had he known it, bus. Loss. The night I was reintroduced to the dark was a grace gifted. Light's absence brought about the birth of peace, for after this loss, Nothing, surely, could ever be worse. For Patrick. Darkness sniffs us out, lolling in abandonment, and settles itself. Language taps down grief. There's comfort in the silence we spread to point words. Wine still in the jug, soda farls buttered, jam spread. You've fallen asleep. Flat under asphalt, creeping under concrete, ivy and bindweed. Veins that skeleton our heart scald, fuchsia bleeding in an autumn hedge. 
wild geese, wings brushing the haunting helpless moon with our cobweb sleeping. An evening seething with starlings, those uninhibited city birds at home here in the cut meadow, soaring and swooping and scrabbling heavenwards. You should have been here too, among friends, reminding us of other summers that pulled the hayfield taut about twilight, funneling the thran drums thrum. Instead, we talked of you, and how you slipped away to open the field, the skilled scytheman whetting the blade, laying low the first untidy swathe, so that in the stinging aftergrass I stood, an orphan sister with a lost childhood. For on a sunny September morning, fields warm humming, dahlias vigilant in the garden, terrier for once not busy, house sound asleep, you sighed, left your heart in the window, were flung far from the farm, are a blind wanderer among ignorant stars, where our thin cries sing sadly, wildly, calling you, calling you, a startled stranger, a disarmed cairn. Our heartache swells out at dusk, when sibilant springs whisper at muddy gaps. Seasons have congealed to the chill of thorns held in thickets, and a scalded milking tin upended on the hedge. Nelly. Apron and slippers, apron pocket with pencil and rubber ready for the crossword, rosary beads, handkerchief, clove rock sweets stuck to their paper bag. She idles through the hours with a head muffled in words, a duster loose in her freckled hand, skin rough as the pitted skin of the soda file on the griddle. The duster is careless over surfaces which show her face distorted. She listens to the wireless, connected to Athlone in a faraway bog. She learns that mistletoe is a parasite, decorating the tree it gorbs on, leeching its life. Then hospital requests that lighten other lives. She's heady with the interest illness brings into her kitchen's comfort. As far as it goes for James as he was dying. Imbolc. At the end of this short day, candles come into their own, steady, slight. They waver only when our stories flare out, and with green rushes underfoot, we'll imagine evenings stretching to the farthest shore, and voices chorusing, and we remembering. Baltina. In the hieroglyphs you drew, my name began with an owl and a mouth. I wanted words of wisdom as we sat balancing our days, folding away our memories, linen fresh from the hedge, scented with the white thorn that ghosts the late spring night. Lunasa. Flames leap, lady assumed into heaven, whatever that means, however she did it, if she did it. Your face in the firelight contorts, and you ask, how will I know I am dead? Sowen. There's a wild wind in the trees tonight, spirits tearing through the mesh of time, freeing us into litanies of being. So put the fat bottle on the table. Three swallows, a golden glow. We'll have a rosiner before we go. Now we know. I was ironing. The wireless was on. I was downtown, walking, listening. I was at my desk. The headmaster came in. When I heard it, he heard it, we heard it. Skies breaking, seas lurching, paths tilting. I didn't know. He didn't know. We didn't know. What darkness was, what pain was, what desolation was, till then. Till darkness seeped into us, till praying fr froze and frosty flowers till desolation was our tomorrow or forever. Then I knew, then he knew, then we knew, the new world that opened. Who would be my bedtime comfort? Who would turn the front door key? 
Who would teach me how to shave? I had been ironing his shirts. I had gone to buy mince for her dinner. I had been dreaming of our fishing trip. Now we know. Mra Kincha, you've come keening women with your ulalu. Why did you die? Why did you leave? Let your black notes hide us. Let your ululation tremble in our blood. For the blood that was spilled is still, still the voice, the hands, the eyes, and the frail eyelids no longer flutter. Oh, why did you leave us? Why did you die? Our hearts beat blood to reluctant limbs, the heart themselves heavy husks, stillness, darkness, absence, absence, stillness. Oh, why did you leave us? Why did you die? The beat of our hearts is sorrow, is blackness, the blackness of your torn shawls, faceless darkness. You echo our heartbeats, you pierce the souls of us. Words for Deirdre. At first I was lost for words, but words do not stay lost. Don't let themselves disappear. They slip out, clustered letters and bold type in italics, sister, gone, grief, silence, emphatic in a new context. The future is now the present tense and the words that I'd hoarded for another day Thanks. We'll throw anything together. Love. Seem meaningless. I'm learning a new language whose sounds are singular. When words were beyond me, you would always have the answer. Now I must work this out. Three across, two down. An orphan and an only child. I have come this far and sit untrammeled in a city garden rimmed with a hum of distance. Here bees are busy and ants with small determination soldier on. Hands are hollow, feet fiercely still. Behind, a girl bold as a scarlet tulip, slender and young. To walk in this garden is to listen, is to have feet clogged with bindweed, is to fret over sun-smashed petals, is to find no balance for uneasy feet. Where my toes take me, the sky is in tatters. Branches sway under quaking birds. There is no constancy in water. I will paint flowers and doves on the fence. Tucked away behind the plum tree, squat behind the plum tree, it waits. Leaves tremble at the window, and one thick cobweb filters that filters the dust hazed light, that dust of childhood hide and seek, that dust and that cobweb darken and deaden me. I sing to know that I am a song that dries on my lips, sticks like mummified flies. I'm as dry as the fretwork cobweb, light as the light winged flies. I'm turning, returning to dust. And this is where I am, in the heart-sore loneliness of evening and the beauty it brings. Grey-shadowed water, querulous birds quibbling over nests, lights in other houses. And here I am, on the edge of it all, sensing the coming darkness. Not afraid, not yet, just wondering. For in darkness it is so easy to lose sense. Outstretched hands push through unfeeling air. Eyes struggle and ears stretch. But if lightning should freeze the darkness into bright antlers, jasper, slivers of jaggedness, I could for that second ground myself. So here I am in the half-light, knowing and feeling my place, wondering and waiting for the shy, sharp evening star. I am here waiting in the wings, perfecting my lines until it's time to go on. Found Poem I found a poem in the waiting emptiness of a room 
with the tassel of the blind beat blindly in erratic rhythm against a pane. I found a poem trembling under a rainbowed puddle shine, trembling in a graciousness of green leaves and in shadows stalking city street lights. I found a poem clouding the kettle's pushy, pulsing seed, crackling from the bed sheets, creases and folds, singing, swinging the wind chimes in the trees. So I took it, emerging, moon cold, marble, to help it find a handhold. The Loop Scholars Distance pulls like spun sugar the brittle threads of sound that waver, rise, echo in the bowl of afternoon. A whoop, a shove and a shout, the loop scholars are out, out through the gate bucketing like wee calves loosed in spring. Time saunters alongside them, halting at every hole in the hedge, offering sweet sorrow, bitter berries. James, John and Anna run, run, run past the trailing rest, boots thumping, elbows pumping, breath failing in their breasts, slitting the skin of summer to expose the yellowed underlay that cushions thinly the coming cold. One autumn. A frog came into the kitchen, right in the middle of the fourth decade, the one I gave out. It sat with a tilly poured its humming yellow circle. We wouldn't touch it in case of warts. And anyway, the prayers continued in drones and cushion muffled snorts of laughter to the last of the trimmings. Then we tried to catch it on a shoebox lid, to tip it back into the sated autumn night. Hectored, its blotched horny hide could barely bind its tiny pulse of life. Cornered it sprang with a sudden retching rise right into a basin of apple jelly. All dead had dripped, the amber drops, essence of stubble fields and tightening dusk. Crab apples, gnarled old trees, arthritic contours masking plenty. The flower bag swung, slung between table and window, its sour squeezings ransoming her hours of hobbled hooking. Next day, she gave it to the pigs, reluctantly, sad to let go her share in one more autumn. Tree Music for David Keyes The flash of ash in this bone-bare winter hedge is in pitch-perfect key. Birch bark tatters flutter, fan dancers to a ragtime rhythm. In the centre, the fairy thorn jigs in time to a wayward wind, and the willow droops, wind-whipped, cross-limbed, swaying in a soft shoe shuffle. The Cellist for Neil Martin When you lift the bow, your face closes as the day's eye does at dewfall. Conjured by the air you coax, your hands, your sure fingers, moving, touching, we exposed are pierced through the skin to delight and sit unsettled. Journeying. Maggie Malone read fortunes. My aunts tossed back the last drops. Her thimble was trim on the china as she turned the tinkling cups upside down on their saucers. She turned each cup lovingly staring in and muttering and clearing her throat. Look, she'd say, a letter is on its way. I hope the news is good. And a stranger is coming, a man by the look of it. Who could that be? And there's a cat, no, maybe a dog. That bird's a warning, and the aeroplane means a journey. She'd peer through her spectacles, and my aunts would shake themselves, collect the dream time dishes, and dump them in the jaw tub. kitchen. A cat slumbering in the sunlight, cupboards keeping their secrets. In here all is warm as a cinnamon bun, brown as the crunch of ginger biscuits. Sunshine pools on the tiles, strikes notes from the edge of the stirabout pot. 
like a contented cat, the kettle purrs and bubbles, plumping and puffing in the range. Honey, scented with clover and orange blossom, slopes off the spoon to sweeten another morning. In the big blue bowl, a scented peach delights the air. Brown eggs nestle warmly. My mother's delf is on the dresser. Somewhere, children crowd and jostle, laughing silently. I know they're there. If I turn quickly, surely I will see them. Island Winter Last night, cold air sidled under the door and lingered. All day wind had thrummed on the rusty wire fence and rattled through, puckled through dried broken reeds. You remembered your grandfather in the depression years, taking his young family on holiday to a house like this and waving burning turf on the tongs to share the scent. Tonight we've moved side by side closer to the fire, to sparkling driftwood and the whiff of falling turf ash. Now, whatever roams outside, pads outside our warmth. We cradle hot whiskies, sealed and settled in. Separation. The swinging fuchsia curtains the cracks in the wall that keep me from you. This cold night, silence like wet flannel, muffles the sighs of lonely hearts. In moonlight the lane, a fall of silver, frozen distance between us. In the icy night, your footsteps pad to my door, your hand hesitates. The knife edge of dawn brings only sorrow to me with the pain of light. The underbellies of clouds press relentlessly onto hollows in my hopes. Over the nettles, the light creeps towards a smoulder of wall-hugging ivy. Under the sky. The wide, clear grey sky was swept clean by the freshening wind that brushed the pelt of wayward grasses that islanded the house that contained the rage that simmered under the clear grey sky. Under the roof, birds chastened the attic air, their clawing herd below like bare feet on broken biscuits. Feet tracing old patterns, feet breaking old patterns, feet drawn to the door to be caught in the whirls of wind-blown wayward grass. When lightning whitened the broken shutters, walls split and love fell out. Catch it before the grasses grow over it, or pull the chocolate soft centre out, or pull the curved smoothness from the rose, or pull the inarticulate hope from sentimental verse. Catch it, I say, catch it. Love that is wide as a clear grey sky, as lonely as the clouds of distant geese going home, going home. Paris revisited. It was ten years since we'd been to Paris. This time the streets were mellow with ghosts, and in cider that poured into the bowl like gold, in milky recar, in Armagnac, we raised a toast. I left a message for Simone de Beauvoir. We followed the steps of Joyce, Beckett and Sartre. We were diminished in the shade of the Pantheon, and sought the tombs of Colette, Wild Abelard. But it was in the familiar streets round Place Clichy that we dandered most and found our feet. Remembering the gracious gift of friendship, the nights of talk till the street sweepers came, when we were young and never tired, and learned to love the wine sparkling Seine, the dancing lady boys, the swooning saxophone, secret courtyards, the loveliness the loveliness of life. So, Paris, may your pavement cafes ring, may your ancient stones keep their memories, may your music swell in our hearts, and may we return. If no one comes. If no one comes, will the dust motes breed? What 
plants push fronds frenziedly over them to feed on my air. I find this burden of light, forcing the corners apart, persists in spite, overpowering all I do to salve my eyes assaulted by emptiness. If no one comes, will the dust so if no one comes, will the shadows meet? What small winged irritant harrows the afternoon, pleating little sounds around the blind? The crack in the china bleeds across, exploding spider lines to fuse wing beat and heartbeat, both measuring. My blurred core crouches off centre. If no one comes, will the dark lie down? What worm slips against the wood, searching round for one crevice, just the right size for a wormy shape. I cannot see in this. My hands push away. All I come up against are my own bones peeling. I thought you were following. I thought you were following, he said, and turned on the green. His gaze was towards the sea slipping past to Derry and towards the boats fast in the harbour. Mine bent to the crushed scent of his passing, to note only a broken stem and one small shell that housed the water's secret call. The Moss Road The evening is pleasant, but swallows are skimming low, sign of a sad summer. And under the smooth asphalt, we sense things lurk, whitened roots, uneven stones, lacy fossils, bloodied turf. Those who spread the tar, the screenings, who rolled it flat, meant it to last, but didn't understand our moss roads, their ability to offer sudden jolts, belly bumps, the possibility of rifts and cracks and chasms. All it takes is one strong soul to shout to the winds, to the hungry listeners, and to unpick one corner, leaving the rest to time, to frost, and to the certainty that the swallows will return. Alison is 70. Long ago, when our beach fire spat at the dark, we baked potatoes. The boys drank stout, and we, islanded, felt safe. Now we can discern an edge to the sea's simper. Know that potato skins burn as keenly as the kisses of those broken boys. We are stranded above youth's tideline, our scars proudly borne. We know what fearless is, flying alone above the star-tipped waves. New Year's Eve. The evening hardened early dark with a clean smell of snow. Our feet pattered on the pavement, year's end, a letting go. Your muted lamplight invited us, a glimpse of firelight and a jug of hopeful white hyacinths that lit the needy night. Kate is originally from County Down, but is now living in County Donegal, where she has been running the Summer Palace Press with her mother, Joan, also a poet. She was educated at the University of Cambridge and is a former editor at the Institute of Irish Studies at Queen's University, Belfast. She is the recipient of a number of poetry awards and also the author of a number of volumes of poetry. Her last volume of poetry was published in 2018 and is called Ask Me Next Saturday. Um, this is a sequence um, called Take Care. I'm sorry, Sheila. It didn't matter to you that your daughters had hung fine linen curtains in your room with purple plum blossom that matched the bedspread. You told me you had painted the picture of a petunia, but you wouldn't raise your eyes to look. It was all wrong. 
the night you sat on the edge of the bed crying, unable to get your pyjamas up or down, a dreadful composition. I bit my lip at the aesthetics of grieving across the corridor, the lovely note in response to our condolences. I'm sorry, Sheila, for the brutal rights we afford each other inside family. I'm sorry for the tidy way you were tidied away, even if they were following your own rules of perspective. I'm sorry, Barry. I made an excuse to exit when you began about the nest of snakes and keeping the door shut. There were seven snakes and one unaccounted for. I'm sorry to appease my fathers, just ignore him. Helpless in broad daylight as you shout, can you put the light on? I don't like the dark. Can you put the light on? As if I'd never admired your extensive collection of records and CDs, Elvis to Dickie Rock, shelves of show bands, and your quip back to my compliment, what are you selling? I'm sorry to ignore the pouch of dark urine, the special chair for amputees I'd never seen you in. I'm sorry to walk past your open door, as if you'd never told me how you lost your first love before your first date with her, signing up for the RAF. We'll see you on Saturday morning. Oh, I can't I have a date. Too late. I was telling the truth the last time we spoke, when I said there was no landing platform under the window. I had to agree with you then that the only way out of here was if you got onto the roof. I'm sorry, Phyllis. I'm listening to the words of a Turkish journalist imprisoned for his thoughts. He can, he says, still converse with anyone beyond his cell because the mind knows no confines. My mind is on Phyllis, in the room opposite my father's in the care home. What are you doing here? She shouts. Her door is open. No one is there. I don't want you here. You can get out, for you don't belong here. No one is there. Speak up, she yells. My father's door is also kept open a magnetic device which sometimes obsesses him. No one told us. We were laughing and the television was loud when her relatives came out from her room, tear-stained, and closed the door behind them. I'm sorry, Phyllis. No one is there. I'm sorry, John. It's your endless lucidity, your tone which would sound better in the Chamber of Commerce or a headmaster's office. Please, could someone help me? Please, I require assistance. Someone, could I have some help? Once I glanced into your room, you were sitting in your vest and an incontinence pad, Help me, this is a disgrace. I'm naked in here. A child could come in or anything. Nothing you say is unreasonable. I'm sorry, John. It's the careful enunciation of your polite demands that's so terrible. The dreadful depth of your decency, like a soundtrack of our own conditioning. I'm sorry, we've all got used to it. So staunch, you're like the disembodied voice of the body's unstaunchable needs. Ah, Cynthia. 
I'm sorry Bill didn't come today. I'm sorry you went to bed early, fully clothed again, just in case. Well done, Anna. Even your complaints were delicate. Oh, can you look in those drawers, see if I have a brazier? My husband's coming, but I couldn't ask him, I just couldn't. Still a dancer, feather boned in your loose mauve jumper, your mind prone to soubres and dips, glissading your affections at night on the threshold of my father's room. Good night, darling. Is my husband asleep? My father's gruff when next I visited. Close the door behind you, will you? I've more to be doing with my time. Holding the door frame, swaying in panic at forgotten moves. Oh, please, I do need help. I wish I knew what. As though some unseen was about to launch you into a grand jeté onto the corridor floor, drop you in an unrehearsed tango swoop. You were right. Nobody could turn, assemble, levé in that room, emboîté. You did need to get home. My father is letting go of something, of everything, but not the whereabouts of his slippers or the hammer he needs for that nail that persecutes him poking out above the sill. Of words, though, these last few days, he's like a swimmer through syllables who's too tired to care that he's no longer out of his depth. After four hours of blood transfusion, my father was raving. Are you okay? Well, I am and I'm not. They had come from the south of France or the south of England. Who? Well, have you seen them? Perhaps some blood donor gifted you these inconvenient, inconsiderate ghosts who came to visit but bypassed you, or four hours of chat with the blood nurse when I've relished an afternoon off, were you simply crazy with a day of kindness and conversation? It's months and months since I tried to read aloud to my father from Tolstoy's A Confession and Darwin's it was snowing butterflies, both penguin pocket books. I stopped reading Darwin at the spider's web on page five. Undulations like a film of silk blown by the wind in an ascending direction from the orifices. There is liberation in the fact that my father is faking listening but it does not last. We stop Tolstoy on page three of the Penguin Great Ideas series at the first mention of his loss of faith. My father professes fervently not to have any. It is Burns Day today. Someone has left in each room a photocopied page of poems. I read the shortest. And say the Lord be thank it. My father is listening. The Lord. The Lord. The Lord. Is she still alive? Your mother, Kathleen? No. Oh no. Reg, he's alive though. Your father? No. And Barry, your brother, died in a plane crash a long time ago. It is disarming, this sudden concern from a man who couldn't cry when his mother died 
or when his brother died. I'm sorry for the bereavements which keep on coming when we discuss the family tree, as if they've all let him down by dying, or has he let them down, as if death was an indictment of us all, as if time was a failure of understanding. The happiest I've seen him in weeks. My father has hatched a plan. It has no name. What I'm going to get, it's this long, about this long. Maybe the smallest one. No, I think I'll just get the standard one. I can't quite remember at the top. Yes, just curved. You can get them in different colours. You can walk with them. I'm going to get one, not today, when I get home. That's the plan anyway. I'm looking forward to it. The spine of the tattered thesaurus, broken into sections. A spent match marks page 368. What was he searching for those years ago between parsimony and passion? Where were you? Working. As in? I take as reassuring my father's familiar disregard as we begin to elide into each other. How's my, not my mother? My father has started biting his lip. Tell your mother I'd like to see her. I wish I hadn't happened upon the nurses in the hall convulsed with laughter, offering to kiss my father. She'd been rebuffed with Bleh! face contorting. They kept repeating, kept mimicking. Bleh! Alarmed by his fuzzy failing speech, I ask my father to enunciate a full sentence before I leave. He astounds me with, you're expending too much on unimportant things. Obladi, oblada, life goes on. We're all huddled like migrants in the care home dining room for the Christmas party. Pale in his yellow paper hat, the red felt reindeer, my mother's sewn on his jumper. My father says his hip is hurting. Anthony's wife has insisted they be allowed to join in, even if the wheelchair is deemed unsafe for him. Four years ago, he could climb mountains. Mary won't eat a bite. Your daughter will be here tomorrow. Barry is dressed as an elf with pointy ears. What's more, I'm 93. Irene, good night, Irene. The fortune fish refusing to twitch. The cracker jokes having to be explained. I'll take you home again, Kathleen. At the mercy of the timing, we sing messily, overlapping words, oobla da, oobla da, my father and I sharing phrases like tonics, marshmallows. I eat the biscuit, he the chocolate, and all the flowers are dying, and I am dead, as dead I well may be. I say I have to leave, and he? No, I'll stick the course. burst out singing. Birds can breathe in while they're singing, a different tune from each lung. They can make music on the inhale as well as the exhale. At the place on the towpath where my father died, no, he died in the care home, the patch of air, the dip of earth, the sluck of riverbank where he died in me. I have heard birds, an orison, their separate tunes from their separate lungs, 
unseen among the chorus of leaves, an avian hallelujah. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer do. Only three songs between us, my father and me. Mersey dotes and dozy dotes and to strengthen his larynx, coax his throat back. Turn again, Whittington, to its habit of swallowing. I was all how bellowing into me, loud out of me as I ran. They said he pounded his chest with his fist. Mares eat oats and does eat oats. The track of his porridge to his right lung passed his voice box. Is April the cruelest month? You couldn't imagine the small boat outlined in the bay without Francis. Always Con and Francis and the dog. Always Francis and Con. They kept that old balance, the one or the other knowing the lilt of the gearach, the small waves, and how to answer the boat to the tidal pull. It was a funeral no one could attend. The priest never came to give the last rites. The fishermen wondered if they stood far enough apart. Would they be allowed to give Francis a guard of honour? I dreamt a darkest night, where the black was salty with storm's spittle, Francis's voice outroaring the gale. Francis, not calm, bellowing, What did you do that for? Waking back into the day, with the virus wallpapering all the rooms of our fear, feeling I was still in some wild night where it's the dead who howl for the living, where we are two metres apart from ourselves, trying not to breathe a word of it to each other. California, oh California, I'm coming home. She stands crying in paradise. She's come back and the fire has burned up the very ghost of her house. They had two minutes to escape. She'd thought of the animals, then her husband. Sucked into the blaze with the forest, home has coughed itself out as black absence, grey aftermath. The metal box of the stove stands ridiculous. When my godmother was cremated, her ashes passed around, carelessly I thought, in the cupboard under the stairs, and one friend remarked, she's heavier than my sister was. We know nothing about being through fire, or how the body houses love. The woman in paradise gathered up her animals, then her husband's urn. In those last moments, she saved his ashes from the flames. This is about one of the Irish giants, Patrick Murphy. It's time, Patrick Murphy. Take the chills, the high fever, take the headache, the backache, the bellyache and boking, and multiply it to the size of that enormous man, that Irish giant adrift in Marseille. Bad enough for anyone, the rash on the forearms, on the face, on the torso, the blisters that break and scab over, 
but unthinkable. His reach, his vast hands trying not to rip at his skin, his limbs thrashing about in an ordinary bed, a terror to himself in that foreign port, in and out of delirium as ships hove to and the fog was all Carlingford Loch and him back in Rostrever, Kilfichan, sleeping between his parents, James and Peggy. A tall young man when he left for Liverpool to work on the docks, but it was his return, too late for his father's funeral. He couldn't have taken a lift of the coffin anyway. He was like a lumbering gantry, a prodigal parody of himself, a good foot taller than when he'd left, and still growing like forced rhubarb, all pale and lank. Not the first man to get too big for his boots, lose a farm in Tam Neve, say he'd outgrown the place. He couldn't shake off that down from the mountains awkwardness. They stared the people of Kilbrony, halted mid-sentence, while he gabbled on about nothing, unstoppable as the Cassie water. His reticence hardly mattered in the travelling circus. They spoke for him, pointing out his long arms and long feet, him all vertical and bizarrely shy, repeating that all his body parts were just as impressive, all in proportion. He saw more than he ever wanted over the hedges and ditches into people's stunted desires. Lonely in Kilbrony, lonely in Marseille and all the shrinking places in between. It took the smallpox to bring down that huge humanness, the big death of his bewildered body, aged 28, the only way he could come home to stay. Vital. His last utterance is a rebuke to his beautiful companions. It irks me if I am late for prayers, even by a minute. The pocket watch is there in a glass case and one of the bullets. The blood patterning the homespun of his dhoti and shawl looks like a menstrual stain, the aberrant unstaunchable that disgusted him. He blamed himself for copulating with his wife while his father lay dying, that ecstatic ebb from him, culpable somehow in his father's final failing. As he stares a lifetime later at his dead wife, she seems younger surrounded by flowers. His eyes are haunted, raging. Ghosts line up to garland his guilt. It is hard to love the truth. We scavenge for what is holy among the human and hunger for what is human in the holy. There are two of Gandhi's teeth his dentures, his fountain pens, his ointment, his blood pressure monitor, his hand in a photograph like a tightening bangle around the juvenile arm of his great niece. In the National Gandhi Centre in Delhi, part shrine, part museum, they have framed an electrocardiograph taken on the 28th of October 1937 in a clinic on Elgin Road, Calcutta, consultation by appointment only. Most alive in the sublimation, Mahatma Gandhi slept naked with two young women. He often said he was half woman, 
but the body's wishful. The body seventy-seven years on the earth, night breath and how skin speaks to skin. They've digitised the graph so it pulses still, an electronic bleep and a green luminous line, the heart's mantra without a heart. Satyagraha, a sign says, is a relentless search for truth. Thank you, Kate and Maura, for supporting us tonight. I hope you have all enjoyed our readings tonight as much as we have. If you would like to support us, since we are a voluntary organisation which relies exclusively on grants and donations, you can do so by emailing the City Chapter at the following address, armacitychapter at gmail.com. Thank you very much for supporting us. I hope you have enjoyed this and I hope to see you in 2021.